Thank you so much for joining us at Oak City Church. We're very happy you decided to spend your Sunday morning with us. Today, we are in the book of Amos and finding Jesus in the Old Testament. I would advise you to go back either on our Facebook channel or our YouTube channel and watch the previous lessons by myself, Pastor Bobby, and Pastor Daryl as we have gone through every book of the Old Testament leading up to Amos, and we plan on finishing the entire Old Testament before we're finished. Um, today, we're going to start in, in uh, verse one. And as far as we can tell, as far as I can tell, and, and from what I've studied, I can't really see any place where Amos um, is known for being a prophet or he's some uh, a preacher or something like that. He clearly is a prophet, um, but, but he seems like, uh, you know, his profession is kind of laid out in this first verse. So without further ado, we're just going to jump straight in. This book is a, uh, a book that talks about the judgment of God. And one of the greatest lies in our society, one of the greatest lies that God will not judge sin. And that's just not true. In fact, uh, you know, Christians should know better than anybody that God judges sin because uh, what happened on the cross at G at, with Jesus, I mean, God was punishing sin um, on the cross. And uh, just because he doesn't always hold sin to our account doesn't mean that he doesn't judge it. All sin gets judged. It either gets judged through the through what Jesus suffered at Calvary or he get judged, judged because we reject what Jesus did at Calvary. And then God chooses to judge it um, separate from Jesus, which, which always results in a failed attempt at, at a, a fulfilling whatever we're trying to fulfill. <laughs> I mean, we cannot be righteous. The Bible says that, that our righteousness is like filthy rags that God. Imagine how holy and amazing God is. Um, so... Um, Without further ado, we're just going to jump into the book of Amos. So uh, verse, uh, chapter one, verse one, um, and we're going to read a few uh, verses in this chapter. And then I'm going to get to the place where I really think I see Jesus um, in this particular book. OK, so chapter one, it says the words of Amos, who was among the herdmen of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam the son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. That, is, that would be Jeroboam the second. That's not the first Jeroboam. Um, but two years before the earthquake. Now, I love how the Bible does this because it's kind of cool. No other document in the world, uh, like, like archaic document, seems to add little details that we don't even know. We don't know exactly what earthquake they're referring to here, but the audience that that... Amos was expecting to read this, knew about an earthquake that happened two years, uh, and, and, and they, they, they were able to navigate um, where in time this particular event happened because he, he left that reference for them, which is so, so cool. Um, and verse two, it says, and he said, the Lord will roar upon uh, from Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem, and the inhabitants of the shepherds shall mourn, and the top of Carmel shall wither. Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Damascus, and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because they have threshed Gilead with the threshing instruments of iron. But I will send a fire into the house of Haziel, which shall devour the palaces of Benadad. I will break also the bar of Damascus and cut off the inhabitant from the plain of Avon. And him that holdeth the scepter from the house of Eden and the people of Syria shall go into captivity under Kerr, saith the Lord. Now, I want you to know that he continues to, to make these statements amongst and he, he talks about every single um, small area around Israel. And I can just see, like for me, I would definitely, like if I was from Israel, I'd be like, yeah, get them, God. You know, judge, judge Damascus, judge all these other places. He talks about Tyra, Damascus, Ammon, Moab, Eden, Gaza, all these places 
um, he 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 is he talks about and 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 you're thinking like thank you G I can just see because because we love sometimes we love the judgmental side we love to say yeah that's judgment on that person the, those people they they've been acting up they're they're under judgment. And, uh, and, and, and that's, that's kind of how this letter is flowing, except for in chapter two, after he, he keeps talking about place after place after place that he's going to judge, he gets to Israel, Judah and Israel. And he talks about judging them. And in fact, he takes off. He spends a whole lot more time talking about judging them, particularly Israel in this case, than judging all those other nations. He even mentions as a problem with them is that he embraced them by the hand. He took them out of the land of Egypt and they have the audacity to steal sin and serve false gods. So because they had like, like that was more egregious to God than even the sins of these foreign nations that he had mentioned prior to that. And when you read this book, he spends lots and lots of time talking about judgment and what's going to happen and certain calamities, some of which take place 40 years. Yeah, Amos actually predicts um, what happens 40 years later when Israel is sacked and and uh, and, and, and overthrown. So, um, but when we see this, um, this seems like a very dark, dark picture, but there is hope. Um, as long as God is, there is hope and God's always going to be. And, uh, and, and in the book of Amos, the last chapter, chapter nine, he says these words, he says, in that day, <laughs> I will raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen and close up the breaches thereof. And I will raise up his ruins and I will build it as in the days of old that, the, that they may possess the remnant of Edom. And of all the heathen, which are called by my name, saith the Lord that doeth this. This is actually repeated in the New Testament in the book of Acts chapter 15. Now, that was Amos chapter 9, verses 11 and 12. And this is what Acts chapter 15, verse 16 says. He says, after this, this is James actually speaking here. But he says, after this, I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up. So this is a promise of restoration, a promise that we see completed um, in Jesus Christ. Now, I will say this. I do believe that, that this prophecy, and even when, when James repeats this particular prophecy in, in the book of Acts, is not only a messianic prophecy, it is also a, I believe, an end times prophecy as well, because um, the Gentiles are part of the are part of this mystery that God had this plan from the very beginning to win the Gentiles. The Bible even says it says that that God chose a Gentile nation initially, like He He re looked to the Gentile nation, He chose Abraham, like He didn't have a He didn't have a select people. He chose Abraham, and um, so, and, but it, it comes around full circle, and the Gentiles receive the gospel, believe on Jesus Christ, they are saved, and he, uh, and and it is just a beautiful, beautiful picture of of God's plan throughout time. So, Jesus' plan. Now, when Jesus comes back during the millennial kingdom, Jesus is going to reign and rule on earth. And, uh, and I do believe that that is a, that, that we can even look at this prophecy a step further and say, okay, everything is going to be restored when Christ returns his kingdom in full effect. And that's why, that's why I feel that this is not only a messianic prophecy, this is a end times prophecy about the Messiah as well. Um, so uh, Jesus restores, he brings, um, Everything that's fallen down, he restores it all. Now, we know that Jesus, when he came um, to earth, did not attempt to restore Israel. That, that wasn't what his, his focus was. And I think that that's a stumbling block for, for the Jews in many ways, because um, for, for many reasons. But 
when he returns, he will um, restore. And this is why that this particular chapter is, is the chapter that I say shows us Jesus. Because when we're dead in our trespass and sin, ready, ready and right for judgment, there is hope. Like Jesus Christ, God sends Jesus while we're yet sinners. We're trapped. There's no way out of judgment. But God sends his son to die on a cross for us. Um, he sends restoration. He sends peace. He sends comfort um, through Jesus Christ and the finished work of the cross. Um, and if you'll put your trust in Jesus, no matter how far you, how mad you think God is. One time I told my mentor, I said, I think God might be mad at me. And I was wanting him to say, no, nah, God's not ever mad at you. God, you know, you're good. You know, God, God's a God of love. He just never mad. But, you know, he, you know, he said he said he might be. <laughs> he said he might be mad at you. And I'll never forget that day because, you know, I, I kind of was hoping he'd say the other stuff. But but um, but here's the deal. No matter even if God is mad, even even if you feel so far away from God, you just don't know if there's any way back. Let me tell you something. God is not going to let the blood of Jesus Christ go useless. Like, like if he was willing to send his son to die on a cross for you, then all you have to do is turn around and trust in Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And if you'll choose to trust in Jesus Christ today, you will live forever. So. I hope that you choose to trust in Jesus Christ today. I'm so happy that you decided to be with us today. We'll see you next time in Jesus' name. The things that you go through Seems nobody goes with you Your life's feeling kind of dry And you're just a crane, get your high